Python is slow. This much is known. However, a fair deal less is known about how to speed it up. That's the focus of this session. After all, if we're going to get into data-oriented design, we'll need to get comfortable with low-level programming. So let's go. The exercise today is pretty much taking this ray tracer and optimizing it. You can see this in the GitHub repo linked in the video description below. It's pretty much your standard ray tracer inspired by ray tracing in one weekend. We can give it a go. There we go. And here in the terminal, we can see that that render took 34 seconds. Okay, cool. So the question is, can we make it faster? Now, usually this is done through trial and error and experience, and we'll be doing some of that, but a great first step is to have a profiling tool running. So for this, I'll be using C profile. Okay, so the most important thing is that our code that we want to profile can be called from a single function. That's what I've got here. That's what this main loop is doing. When we've got that, we can go over to a separate Python file and set up the profiling. And that's it. So we can go ahead and run this. And this will take a little longer than it normally does because profiling has some overhead. So there we go. We can then close that down and we get this big report. So we'll bring this up. So what this is doing is this is basically telling us which functions are taking the most time. The profiler just times the functions. Up the top, we can see that we've got hit, trace, and render line. These are the hotspots of the code. These are the parts which are sensitive to optimizations. If I speed these things up, that will have a big effect because they're very small functions which individually are executed very quickly, but in total take a long time because there's just so many of those calls. Anyway, sensitive, it's sensitive code spots. Okay, um, another thing that I'm noticing is this random uniform function seems to have a pretty big total time. So that's something we can look at. It might be the case that there's nothing we can do, but at least we know to look at it. Pygame pixel copy to surface, we need that anyway to blit the thing onto the screen. There's nothing we can do about that. But some of these other functions like max and min, cos, sign, len, these built-in functions might be things that we can investigate. And to start things off, we'll go with the hotspot, the hit function. So here's the hit function. Yeah, I'll just sort of leave this on screen for a little bit. So see if there's anything we can do to speed this up. For one thing, we have this debug parameter, which actually isn't being used. I think when I originally ported this code, I had that in there, but clearly we're not using it. The fewer parameters we use, the fewer work is, less work is being done in the prolog to uh, load and unload variables into registers. So another thing is this use of slices. It's a handy, convenience feature, right? I don't have to write a lot of code and it's easily readable for humans, but there's an extra overhead in Python, not a big overhead, but remember these functions, although they execute very quickly, the profiler told us they're being called a whole bunch of times. So we probably want to eliminate whatever overhead we can. Okay, so fingers crossed, I think that's it for the list slicing. 
Let's give this a go and see what happens. Okay, that's promising. We've gone from 34 seconds down to 30. The next hotspot that I wanted to look at was the trace function. So here's the trace function, and there's actually a number of things off with this. For one, rem remember that min and max were giving weird results. So what we could do is we could try removing them and just seeing if this works. Okay, yep, no errors. And then we'll just go ahead and remove that max. Sort of, it's a good idea to nudge things one bit at a time. Okay, yep, great, cool. All right, so then looking through the code, we can probably even just remove that alpha variable entirely and just work with that. So then something that's jumping out at me is, remember I said len is a problem. And this is a massive problem, right? Because we've got this array of data representing all of the spheres. And that's a fixed thing. We're not adding and subtracting spheres. And we're certainly not adding and subtracting, like we're not going to have a different number of spheres for every random sample of the scene. So what we can do is we can take that sphere count and declare that just under the declaration of spheres, because that's a constant value. Now looking in here, we've got more uh, list slicing. So let's get rid of that. But hang on, what's going on here? So what I've got is I've defined up above every seven floats is all the data that we need to fully describe a sphere. X, Y, Z for the center, the radius, and then RGB for the color. So the number of spheres would be the length of this array divided by seven. And then in order to fetch the attributes for the sphere, I would need to take the sphere index, multiply it by seven, and then offset from that base index. But why do we do that? Why do we do that? Because we're multiplying by seven a whole bunch of times. What we could do is we could work out seven times i once, but it might make a little more sense just to step the loop up by seven. And then we don't need to multiply because i is directly our base index. So scanning through this, this all looks pretty good. One thing that is jumping out to me is in this hit function, we've got this hard coded, that's the, the near distance. So any ray closer than that will fail. But if it's hard coded, then we can simply literally hard code it. Like I said, the fewer parameters we have in a function, the better it's generally gonna turn out. Oh, I forgot this. All oh, right, okay. So there's also this weird if statement thing here. So this is from ray tracing in one weekend. What it's doing is this initial value for root is checking the closer edge, the closer face of the sphere. And then if that fails, we look at the further edge of the further face of the sphere, assuming I guess that the ray is inside the sphere. We can just make the assumption that that's not gonna happen. And that simplifies and we've reduced a number of parameters. And there we have it, that's gotten us down to 28 seconds. Not super dramatic, but an improvement is an improvement. Okay, so that's the trace. And then the next function was the, um, whoops, the render line function. So take a second here. It's not a big function but it is making a really big issue. And that is the constant recalculation of horizontal and vertical coefficients. They're happening for every single sample. So eight times per pixel. But the only thing that's changing is that little bit of random variation. So what we can do is we can actually sort of, and there's no reason that we would be choosing the larger dimension multiple times because that's never going to change. So 
the idea is I want to do as much setup as I can up front. So I'll set that. And then here I'm also going to give these initial values and I'm going to be a little bit cheeky. So the Y coefficient, we only need to calculate once and the horizontal coefficient, we don't even calculate. I can say, let's start at a value of negative one and then increment by a small amount for every different X coordinate, every incremental X coordinate. Just like that. And then in here, I'm going to apply that random variation. Now, furthermore, we've got this uh, bounds checking on RGB, and it's not necessary because we know that we're always going to be adding positive numbers, right? So there's no reason that this would be going below zero. Now, it turns out we do need that maximum bound because there are some cases where it's going to go out of bounds, but we've at least reduced the number of those function calls. Okay, so currently we're still at 28 seconds. A little faster than we had, it was 28.7 or something before. Optimizing, I guess, let's look at sine and cos. So sine and cos are occurring in the random in unit sphere function. What we could do is instead of getting, you know, theta, we could calculate the cosine value right now and then use some trig identities to get the sine value. I found in practice that the CPU overhead was too much in Python, so I didn't go with that. But what we can do is if we look here, we're getting cosine of the phi variable multiple times. And every time we do this, it's going out and calling a function. It doesn't take long, but you know it's happening a lot of times. So we can store that value like that, and then we can reuse that. Okay, so that's gotten us down just under 27 seconds, or well, just under 28 seconds. Um, but then we have uh, uniform, right? And like I said, uniform was showing up as taking a while. So it turns out that random dot random is fixed. It gives us an, a random float between zero and one. And it turns out that's faster. And likewise up above in the render line function for that random variation. Okay, that gets us down to 26 seconds. So C profile will time function execution, but it won't tell us anything about, say, memory access costs. For that, I'm gonna pull out one of my tricks. Um, so let's analyze a typical trace of our program. The render line function gets called and it gets passed in or it takes in some sort of camera info and then it calls the trace function and it passes along some sort of ray info. And that trace function is going to call the hit function, which takes in some ray info, some info about a sphere which we're testing and a hit record that passes back to the trace function and that then can call the random in sphere function which takes in a hit record. So we can sort of see that these functions are starting to like, they're passing around common data. And in fact, if we have a look at a diagram of each function and which bits of data it's using, we see that it's possible to replace all of this with just a single list that has all the data that we need, but the location, the spatial location of the data is clustered together so that when we need some data, it's always together on the list. So I'm not going to go through in full detail because this is fairly, fairly unreadable, but just for completeness, here's my unreadable implementation. It's all based around this variable named cache. It's got 32 numbers and that's the common data store 
for all of this info. So for instance, uh, the camera info, the first three elements of that list represent the camera's position. And then the next three represent the camera's forwards direction and all of that. And in these function calls, we just pass around that cache. Anyway, enough suspense. Let's see how this does. Okay, so that's pulled it down to 21.9 seconds. Listen, I know it's not the fastest program. This is literally just what can I do to my, what torture can I put my CPU through, basically. But 21.9 seconds, that's pretty good. Okay, so there we have it. Look, the purpose of this video is not just to rant about a specific example, but just to show that if we want to look at performance, we need to have some metrics and we need to know how to use our metrics. Otherwise, it's just guesswork. So yeah, there we go. As we learn more about data-oriented design together, it will be important to keep this spirit of investigation alive and healthy. But you know, that's enough for now. Happy coding. Bye. Hi, so I just wanted to take a second to say thank you to all of my channel supporters. If you would like to support the channel, it's $2.50 a month. That's all I ask, but it's not expected. If you are not able or willing to support the channel financially, the best thing you can do is the usual. Like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you'd like to see. Let me know what you're enjoying because I am trying to make the best educational content that I can under the constraints. So with that out of the way, really big thank you to Antonin Karet, Dankiel Foles, Declan, Andalon Studios, Isaiah Meyer, Mathieu Duric, Moim, and Shreya. Thank you so much, my dudes. I really do appreciate it. It's fuel for the fire. Keep me going, keep me motivated. Um, but yeah, have a great one, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.